Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O most holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in substance, we ask you to strengthen, protect, and sanctify our souls and bodies, for we are weak. May we grow in purity all the days of our lives, O Lord our God, to you be glory and thanks forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to God who is known in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true God. The angels glorify him and people on earth thank, worship, and exalt him. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true God, without division and beyond our understanding, you are the hope, strength, refuge, and salvation of those who believe in you. Now we implore you through the fragrance of this incense to pardon those who have done wrong, guide those who have gone astray, perfect those who are righteous, and purify those who have sinned. Be a father to orphans and care for widows, feed the poor, dispel all doubts, comfort the sorrowful, soften hardened hearts, and fill oppressors with compassion. Satisfy the hungry, assist the distressed, and accept those those who repent. May we and all the faithful departed, our fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, and our leaders believe in you and rejoice in your kingdom. We raise glory and thanks and adoration to you forever. Glorious and most holy Trinity, we ask you to accept the fragrance of this incense and to protect us, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Kadishat,
incense, that we may praise you with purity and listen to your holy scriptures. To you be glory forever. Shout with joy from the mountains to the Holy Trinity. Offer praise to the Lord God, one true God in persons three. Lord our God, you accepted what the just In your mercy, our pure sacrifice and prayers. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery so that you will not become wise in your own estimation. A hardening has come upon Israel in part until the full number of Gentiles comes in and thus all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away godlessness from Jacob and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. In respect to the gospel, they are enemies on your account. But in respect to the election, they are beloved because of the patriarchs. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you once disobeyed God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they now have disobeyed in order that by virtue of the mercy shown you, they too may now receive mercy. For God delivered all to disobedience that he might have mercy upon all. O oh, the depths of riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unscrutable are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given him anything that he may be repaid? For from him, and through him, and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Praise be to God always. For the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. <clears throat> 
Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. We make a solemn to listen to the gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Apostle Matthew writes, The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some had doubted. Then Jesus approached and he said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of this age. This is the truth, peace be with you. Jesus drew near to them and spoke to them. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he told them. As my Father sent me, so I am sending you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. When we speak about Trinity, it is not firstly a doctrine it's an experience within the church of a reality of God revealing himself. You know, the initial presence of God chooses, the divine love creates. And from all eternity, this action of the infinite and eternal charity chooses to make things so that they themselves may participate in the goodness of existence and being. But of course, we have no part in that. That's just simply an expression of the divine love. And so we exist. But that is not what God always intended. What God intended is that there be a reciprocal conscious response, not just simply to love. That kind of love, as we mentioned in creation, that's like the love you do for your children. I mean, they cuddle with you on occasion, but they also cause you a lot of heartache too. You just do it because you love them. So you just do goodness. That's the act of creation. But of course, normally within the family, these things will mature and there will be a friendship of reciprocity as they mature and grow. And that's what God desires of human beings, is that there be a response of love for love. And so that's why when we speak about the Trinity, what the Trinity is, is an experience that the church has around the person of Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ, in this revelation of what God's love is for the world so that we respond to it. So the Holy Trinity is only an expression, an articulation, a teaching, and therefore a doctrine. It does have a doctrine, obviously, to it. But doctrine just means teaching. But why does it teach this? It teaches because of the experience within the church of how God has revealed his love to us, who he is. You know, when children are little, mom and dad are God. They cannot fail in any way. Of course, unfortunately, as they grow up, they realize that we're not quite that divine. But in the reality of, because they learn who we are more. When we're little, we're, when we're small, they're the ones who feed us, they protect us, they guide us, they do everything for us. And so there is this response in a sense, but it's just because of what they are. But if who they are is something that we mature into, and sadly on some cases we realize we don't like who they are. Some cases we find even more profound depths of reasons to love them 
because of who they are. This is what's taking place around the person of Jesus Christ in this experience of communicated love, which we express in the threeness of one, this word that we made up, Trinity. You're used to it now, but in fact, philologically, it's a very strange thing that was made up. It's a neologism, it's not, it's not new anymore, of the idea of three, of tris, of tres, of three, of unum, of one, and then the quality, tas, the tree unum tas, the threeness in one, or oneness in three, that the one divinity communicates this love. So it's a question for us of hearing, and in hearing, responding, and in responding to listen. Listening is different than just hearing, as we all know. And in listening, we learn and we enter deeply into that love. Which is why for people who are in love, they can spend all hours, hours and hours discussing things which in themselves are completely unimportant. We've talked about, you know, who cares what you did in third grade? But if I love you, I want to know everything about third grade. Tell me about that teacher again. And who was that friend of yours? And what did you do in that second, that second quarter? And that's why you can sit for hours in a cafe, in a restaurant, on a sofa, and just talk and talk and talk and talk. The details don't matter, but it's a way that we discover who. So when we talk about this communicated love or the Trinity within the divinity, this communication is all about presence. Someone, we would never say that there is much of a marriage, not much of a friendship, when you were never around each other and you never communicated. You can't say, that simply, and we know cases like this. People who will, you know, in the later years may still stay together. They live under the same roof, but they have completely parallel lives. They don't talk, they don't communicate. They may still be married, okay, civilly they're together, but we wouldn't say there's a profound love there. When I was first ordained, and I was sent off to Kansas where I worked in a school, there was also a parish in this little village and there was a couple here, or there, they've since gone to their great reward, God bless them, because when I met them, they were only in their 90s. Now that's 30 years ago, so these people certainly have gone into the kingdom. But what was beautiful about them is they had been married for something like 75 years. She had been 17, they were farmers in the Missouri area, Midwest, you know, 75 years before that. So, well, if you do the math, that's 1988, 89. So, you know, the beginning of the 20th century, they had gotten married. She was 17, he was 18, farmers, they married. But the, the, it wasn't so much the fact of the length of their marriage as these people would go out in the evening on occasion when health was good for them, and they would walk their block holding hands. They didn't talk much, because they didn't have to, because they were so melded into one person. They were it was a profoundly beautiful reality that they had acquired, and certainly by being present, by hearing, responding, and listening. And so it made a profound impact upon me, because of course that's what ultimately, when we talk about the merging of Christ and the church, one body, one mystical body. That's the reality which is meant to be reflected in the mystery of crowning. Now I wanna to call to you before we talk a little bit more about the Trinity is that the, what you notice in the bulletin this week as I put in and we'll do now for the third year, we're gonna go back to printing the Gospels. But what you're going to have in the Gospels now, if you notice the footnote, is the English translation of the Peshitta. So that's actually the Syriac scriptures. When we read here is the New American Bible, and it's fine, but it's not our tradition. Our tradition is the Syriac Aramaic Bible, which is known as the Peshitto. The Peshitto in Aramaic has the same equivalent in the Latin referring to the Vulgate. It just means the common or straightforward or simplified version for the people to be able to read. That's the original meaning of Vulgate. It's meant for the population a good Latin version when people could read or understand Latin. And so same thing here with the Aramaic. And you'll notice every once in a while nuances that are a bit different. So about a quarter of the time the Syriac text 
is pretty much identical with what would be the equivalent in Greek, the Greek, Byzantine, Constantinople traditions in Greek. But about a quarter of the time, it actually agrees with the old Italian, the old Latin Vulgate versions, and not with the Greek. And then almost half of the time, it just has its own, I mean, they're all obviously essentially identical, but they all have their bit of a nuance. And what I call attention to you today is this phrase that I began the sermon with, that Jesus drew near to them and he spoke to them, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he's told them. And as my Father sent me, I am sending you. Now in the Syriac tradition, we have this phrase, as my Father sent me, so I send you. In the other scriptures, this phrase is also found, but it's found on the day of the resurrection. The morning when our Lord appears to the apostles, peace be to you. As my Father has sent me, so I now send you. But we find it here in this great, what we call the Great Commission. Go forth and make nations your disciples. Not just individual people, but nature, but entire nations, people, means cultures, families. The whole reality of human life is meant to become under this light of learning of the gospel. So it's an interesting nuance. So just, just to be aware that for this following year we'll be doing the gospels um, from the Syriac version. And on occasion I'll pull out some of these different nuances. But it's a beautiful thing connected with the Trinity. As my Father has sent me, so I send you. The word in Latin for sending is missio, mission. Mission just means the act of sending someone. And so when he says that as I have appeared in time from my Father, that same action of sending, I now send you, the apostles, in the whole reality of making and extending this gospel of healing, this grace of redemption. And so I use the word mission because this is your catechetical part, if you like. We use the word mission, and the theologians and the fathers will speak about the sending of the Son, the sending of the Spirit into the world. Pentecost we just celebrated last, last week, which is why the Feast of the Holy Trinity is here, because of the manifestation of the Godhead in the fullness reveals himself historically through the, through the miracles surrounding Pentecost, and through the miracles, of course, of this child born in Bethlehem who dies on Calvary for our redemption, who embraces death to overturn it on its head. This is what we call mission, but this is the mission in time, that God manifests himself in the person of the Spirit. He manifests himself in the person of the Word. So that, of course, but these are Jews who are experiencing this reality, and there's only one God. So what you wind up having is this experience of the divinity which is clearly distinct and at the same time identical. It's like a telescoping of the reality of the spirit, the reality of the word incarnate and the single hidden divinity, the hidden father of one reality is one God but is also three. So it is a relationship aspect that we understand of who God is. And so what the theologians and the fathers point out is that this experience in history is what gives us as believers the understanding of who God is because we've been listening to those stories about the third grade. We know who the person is because we've been present to them, listening, and in hearing, we know who they are. And that's why if you've been married for 75 years, you don't have to talk a lot. You could probably just make a little grunt and a noise and he knows exactly what that means. And he'll just get up and go and get what you need. Or vice versa. Because there's such, such a symbiosis between the two. And that's the experience of the Trinity that in experiencing this incarnate word, the Messiah who appeared among us, I and the Father are one. But I go to the Father. These mysterious phrases which at first sound contradictory. How can you say, I and the Father are one, and then say at the same time, I go to the Father? This reality of this experience to experience the historical missions are indicating to us by this response of faith of who God is and the relations that are in God. Abo, Boro, Rucho, Father, Son, Spirit. 
This reality is expressing of who God is, not what he is. What he is is a single, eternal, subsistent act of existence is what he is. But it's of who he is that he reveals to us. But then the theologians go even further. That not only is this ex her historical experience the understanding of who God is, but that these missions also take place within the soul of the believer, the presence of the word, the presence of the spirit, and that transformation that takes place also, which is why our Lord says to the apostles, if you love me, you will hear, you will obey what I say. Notice for the fetgomo, after the reading, blessed is he who hears the word of God and who obeys it. Obeying is listening. So in hearing that, our Lord says, those who hear and listen, my Father shall come, my Father will love you, and we shall come and make our dwelling within you. So there is a visible mission, a historical aspect, which gives us an understanding of the internal missions of the persons of who God is, and we understand that by grace there is a Trinitarian transformation of the, of the individual believer. Now, of course, we can do a whole series of sermons just on that point. But what I want to leave you with, of course, is the importance of presence. You know, we laughed this morning. Steve was saying it's a beautiful day. I mean, that means no one will come to Mass. Because we're human. This is the way we are. But the very foundation of intimacy and friendship is presence. I said, if you just never talk to that friend you had in college, eventually that friendship just withers and dies. So what is the presence that we have? Because we've all known people who will show up on occasion because they want something. They're creeps. We know they're creepy. We go through life, we meet these people. It's that nephew that never talked to you until he found out that you got Uncle Joe's inheritance. And all of a sudden he's on the phone. Oh, you know, Uncle Jim, I, have, I know we haven't got, we gotta get together more often. He's a leech. That's not presence. That's not intimacy. That's not friendship. Friendship is presence. And that's why when we speak about this aspect, to be able to hear and to respond, that is what gives us the ability to listen of the hidden divinity, to know who God is. So that by presence in this listening, is to develop the communication of God, to know who this divinity, this hidden divinity is. To be unveiled, not just simply in the historical events of the birth in Bethlehem, or the death on Calvary, the resurrection, but that this reality of the hidden divinity be revealed to me, so that my life be transfigured in that friendship, which when we've all experienced true friendship, hopefully, that when we've had a true friend, it is one of the most supportive, consoling, and strengthening aspects of human existence. And that's why scriptures in the Old Testament say that the friend is worth more than silver and gold. And so that's what we're looking for. What is the Christian life? It's living this intimacy to find this communication, to enter deeply into the reality of revealing one to another. Now, of course, we're at a disadvantage because there's not much we need to reveal to the divinity. God knows us completely. But it is that we desire in this friendship that the divinity reveal who the hidden God is within our lives. And so, of course, that first presence is by frequently the divine mysteries. So those who decided that it was nice this morning had decided that the garden was more important than the divine presence in the hidden mysteries. That's the logic. And you will go to judgment day, not you, because of course you're here. God bless you for that. But that reality on judgment day will have to be asked, and what about June 16th, when you decided that the rock garden was more important than my divine son in his death and resurrection. That is what judgment will be. What about all these decisions that you made which you thought were just fine? But in fact, when you actually disentangle it, you're saying that something else was more important than the hour and a half once every seven days. 
That's one aspect. We have this intimacy within the divine mysteries. And as you enter into them more deeply, they will reveal more of who God is. Which is why, starting in the fall, we're going to do the liturgical year, the divine mysteries, and enter more deeply into what these realities are. But the second point is, is that we learn to enter by prayer more deeply in the communication to be able to listen. Not telling God things, that's not what prayer is. Prayer is the communication by lifting the mind and the heart to God. Which means I'm opening myself to understand and to enter more deeply into this mystery. It's why we pray every morning and every night. It's why we pray each day. Why we pray the Angelus. Why this church bell rings every day at noon for the Angelus. And then lastly, you enter into the holy place, what we call contemplation. That we enter into this mystery of God revealing himself to us. Not just in general, what's in my catechism book or in the spiritual writings, but to me, in my life, in 2019, and how that grace is meant to be developing and be communicated through my life to others. Steve gave me a very just rebuke this morning. So last night I was very severe because I talked about how depressing it is that we've totally broken the line of communication of the faith within this community. Not completely. But when you think about the immigrants who arrived here in the early 20th century, they came from families who have retained the Catholic faith for centuries under Mongolians, under the persecutions of Ottomans, under all of these hardships, back to St. Marin in 400. And they came to America to find a breathing space away from persecution, and their grandchildren walked away from that faith. Was it because it was too easy? There was too much of an abundance? God help us. We want abundance, then we have abundance, we walk away from the God of all consolation. So I think I said it more gently this morning. <clears throat> but it is the most stressing aspect, distressing aspect in my priesthood coming to Maine, is to have seen that broken linkage and there are 50 or 60 people who still live in the area who should be in these pews and be in these pews now. There's no excuse for it, and I'm never going to make an excuse for it, and I don't think that it's good. And even if they tell me they're good people, if you, Lord, if you ignore the Lord Jesus, that your ancestors who went under when persecuted and doubt, doubtful, doubtlessly many of them died for the faith, that you should just so blatantly and bluntly just drop it because now you're prosperous in the world. God help us. That we use the excuse of the bounty to drop this relationship with the divinity and friendship it is profoundly sad, profoundly sad. And so for us on that third point of contemplation, it's to ask God to reveal, reveal the divinity to me of who he is so that in my life I be transformed, but in that transformation I be able to communicate that to others. It's a very simple pathway. Hard to do, I know, I know. I do it just like you do. I walk the same path as you do. A little different state, but it's the same thing. It's the same gospel, the same struggles, the same temptations, the same hardships. But none of us can do it if we don't enter into that life of prayer so that we're open to the presence so that we can hear God communicating to us what is Trinity? What is the hidden Father? What is the hidden Word? What is the hidden Spirit? But if we keep that presence, we respond in listening, and in that prayer of openness to communication, we will be transfigured personally. That is promised. You read the Acts of the Apostles, there are thousands of people who are transformed within the first weeks after Pentecost, thousands. Who's communicating? 12 men. But it's because by that communication of those 12 men making disciples of others, those open their ears, they hear, they enter into that intimate divine friendship, and in entering that friendship, they communicate that love to others. That's Christianity. And we've understood that, then we understand the profound aspect of this most holy trinity that we celebrate today.
And I leave you with the last line of our Lord's great consoling message. He says, behold, go and teach them everything that I've commanded you, but go and be aware that I shall be with you all the days, presence. I shall be with you all days until the end of the world. And then the Syriacs add, amen. The message in itself is profoundly beautiful. Open ourselves in prayer, develop that life of daily prayer, and be present in the divine mysteries, and God will work his miracles within you personally and communicate that love through you to others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Telot madeb hei daloho, valvot aloho de pare kayo. Reinu sumot aigo toho keo de baito kwesko de hayet lo or kore sho.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Son and to the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. O God, the Father, lover of all people, though we are unworthy, make us worthy of salvation. Purified of deceit and hypocrisy, and united in the bond of love and peace, through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, may we give one another the greeting of peace with the Holy Kiss. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. of your only sons and your blessings upon those who bow before your holy altar 
We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. the Father, in your love for all people, you sent your Son into the world to bring the lost sheep back to you. Do not turn your holy face away from us as we celebrate the spiritual and bloodless sacrifice, relying upon your mercy and through the grace of your only Son. We ask that this mystery instituted for our salvation not be for our condemnation. Brother, may it blot out all our sins, forgive our faults, and be an expression of our thanks for your goodness. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify you, bless you, praise you, and adore you, and give you thanks, O maker of all things, visible and invisible. The highest heavens and all its powers praise you, the sun, the moon, and all the stars, the earth, the seas, and all that is in them, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, the angels, archangels, and heavenly host all sing, praising your majestic glory with triumphant hymns, with never-ending voices, and with sweet acclamations. They cry out and they proclaim. Christ, and holy is your life-giving Spirit, who delves into all things, even into the depths of God. You are holy and almighty, the Creator and the Good One. You formed us from the dust of the earth and gave us the joys of paradise. When we had transgressed your commandment and fell, you did not abandon us, but like a good and merciful Father, you instructed us. Through the law you called out to us, through the prophets you guided us, and at the appointed time you sent your Son, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, into this world to renew your image. He came down and by the Holy Spirit became flesh of the holy and ever-Virgin Mary and dwelt among us, accomplishing all things for our salvation. Gloria eleison, Labiamo haudoctum hasho dilemma bit haye. En sabe lachmo mida cordi chanton, o bara hu cade. Waxoia bertal mita cardo mara, sabe hula mehene colho. Oh, 
Amen. <laughs> in memory of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death and profess my resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O Lord, we remember your death, your resurrection, your ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your glory and second coming when you shall judge the world with justice and reward all people according to their deeds. Now we ask you, do not repay us according to our sins and transgressions, but in your compassion and love for all people, Cleanse us of all our sins. We, your people and your inheritance, implore you and through you and with you, implore your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit to send and rest upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin Mario, Anin Mario, Anin Mario, Nite Modrojo Chayo Kadisho, Unachena Lainu Alu Korbono, O no. Descent, he may make this bread a life giving body, a saving body, a heavenly body, a body that redeems our souls and bodies, the body of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life for those who receive it. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of the new covenant, life giving blood, a saving blood, a heavenly blood, a blood that redeems our souls and bodies the blood of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life for those who receive it. Amen. May these holy mysteries be for the sanctification of the souls and bodies of the those who share in them, that they may excel in all good deeds. May they be for the strengthening of your holy church, which you have founded on the rock of faith so that the gates of hell shall not prevail against her, delivering her from all heresies and doubts until the end of time and forever. Amen. We offer you, O Lord, the sacrifice of your holy church throughout the world and for the holy places that you have glorified by the presence of Christ your Son, especially for Zion, Jerusalem, mother of all the churches. Remember our pure bishops who spread the word of truth, especially our blessed fathers, Francis, the Pope of Rome, 
Rashada Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the orders of the Church and those who serve her, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your holy Church that you established on the solid rock of the true faith and send her vocations to the holy priesthood and religious life. In a world of distractions which pull us away from properly loving you and our neighbor, may those whom you have called to serve your holy church respond to you and have the courage to follow your will. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, our parents and all our brothers and sisters, those who are praying here with us, those who are not here, and those who have asked us to remember them in our prayers. Answer the petitions that will lead them to salvation. Remember those who have presented the offerings upon your holy altar, or those for whom they have been offered, and those who have desired to make an offering but were unable, those whom we have remembered, and those whom we have not. Reward them with the joy of your salvation and accept their offering upon your heavenly altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and clothe them in your fear that they may stand for justice and establish peace. Remember also captives and prisoners, the sick and the suffering and the afflicted, the needy and those who labor in all walks of life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, the holy and glorious ever Virgin Mary, the patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, St. John the Forerunner, St. Stephen the Archdeacon and First Martyr, St. James the Brother of our Lord, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, St. Charbel, and all the saints. In your grace, count us among them in the Church of the Firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers who spread the word of truth in your holy church and preached your Son, Jesus Christ, to all nations. Through their prayers, grant peace to your church and confirm their teaching in our souls. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O God, of all spiritual and earthly beings, the faithful departed who have died in the true faith. Grant them rest and do not take their faults into account. Through our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed and forgive the sins we have committed. With or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. O 
O Lord, you are the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice that offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself unto me. May your mercy and our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory forever. O God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all consolation, you have sanctified these offerings and the gifts presented to you and have perfected them by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now, so that our pure, with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, Holy Father, God of heaven, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Yes, O oh Lord our God, lead us not into temptation that we do not have the strength to endure. But when we are tempted, deliver us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior who gives life to those who partake in it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, we bow our heads before you, awaiting your abundant mercy. Send your blessings upon us and sanctify us, so that we may become worthy to share in your holy mysteries through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and his mercy and his love for all people. You are blessed and glorified with him and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
again we thank you, Lord, for His glory to you, for giving us your body to you, and giving blood to drink, and the lover of all people, of mercy. We thank you, O God the Father, for your great and indescribable love for all people. Since you have made us worthy to share in your heavenly banquet and in your Holy Spirit, do not forsake us for having received your holy mysteries, but keep us in the radiance of holiness and righteousness. With all the saints, may we obtain a share in the heavenly reward through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you now and forever. Peace be with you. Jesus Christ, our Lord, bless us, protect us, and guide us on the path of life. Favorably remember the departed of those who have shared in this Eucharist that was offered upon this divine altar. Grant protection to the living and bless them with hope 
with the prayers of the Virgin Mary and all the saints, now and forever. Amen. So just a brief reminder, you have it in the bulletin, but that tomorrow the 17th begins the Apostles' Fast. And as the Patriarch is trying to remind us of our traditions, from the 17th to the 28th is the fast, just like Lent, of the season preparing for the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul and the Holy Apostles. So the 17th to the 28th. So you have the notations in the bulletin for reference. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.